Now we will talk about the definition of a refugee. This is very important to understand because UNHCR will assess your case based on whether you meet all parts of the refugee definition. But before we begin, I want to give you a little background of where the definition of a refugee comes from. The definition of a refugee is found in the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol relating to the status of refugees. This is also what we call the UN Refugee Convention. During World War II, an event called the Holocaust resulted in the death of about 6 million Jewish people. A total of 11 million people from different minority backgrounds tragically died during the Holocaust. Millions of people fled from Europe to escape persecution. As a response to the event of World War II, many different countries formed what we now call the United Nations. In 1951, some members of the United Nations signed the UN Refugee Convention, which says that people fleeing persecution in their home country should be given international protection. The UN Refugee Convention includes a definition of a refugee to help determine who requires international protection. The UNHCR is part of the UN who is the guardian of the UN Refugee Convention. Thailand is not a signatory to the UN Refugee Convention. This means it is the UNHCR's job to conduct the RSD process and determine who fits the definition of a refugee. Asylum seekers and refugees do not have any special protection in Thailand. Thai authorities consider foreigners without a valid visa as illegal immigrants. This also applies to asylum seekers and refugees. Asylum seekers and refugees therefore do not have the right to work and are at the risk of being arrested and detained. Thailand very rarely deports asylum seekers, refugees, or in fact, even closed cases. Thailand appears to accept in practice the principle of non refoulement which is a principle of customary international law. However, in some rare and very politically sensitive cases, Thailand may deport asylum seekers and refugees. In assessing your case, UNHCR will determine whether you meet the definition of a refugee. It is important for you to understand the definition of a refugee in order for you to determine which parts of your case will be important to UNHCR. We've divided the definition of a refugee into eight key elements. You have to meet all eight key elements in order to be recognized as a refugee. The first element you are outside of your country. International protection can only apply to you if you are outside of your country of citizenship. The second element, you are genuinely afraid to return to your home country. You fear going back to your country. The third element, you have a good, believable reason to be afraid. In addition to having a genuine fear of going back to your country, you also have to have a good and believable reason to be afraid. This means that your reason to be afraid has to be credible. You must have a well-founded fear. The fourth element, what you are afraid of is something really serious. This has to be more than just being discriminated against or being harassed. What you're afraid of amounts to loss of life, torture, rape, loss of freedom, or a pattern of treatment that makes your life intolerable. The fifth element. You are singled out for this type of treatment because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or your membership in a particular social group. In this element, you have to show that the reason you are being treated badly is connected to either your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or your membership in a particular social group. It is not enough that you are being treated badly 
or that you have been harmed. You have to show that this treatment is connected to what we call a convention reason. The sixth element, the government has harmed you or the government cannot or will not protect you. You must show either that the government has directly harmed you or if you have not been directly harmed by the government, you have to show that the government is not willing to protect you or cannot protect you. The seventh element, you have to show that it is not reasonable for you to move and be safe in another part of your country. It is not enough to show that you cannot live in a particular city or town. You have to show that if you go back to your country, there's nowhere safe for you to live. Or if there is somewhere safe to live in your country, that is unreasonable to expect you to move to that place. The eighth element, you have to show that if you return to your home country, you will face a future risk of serious harm. If you have been harmed in the past, this is important to tell UNHCR. However, you still need to show that if you return to your home country, you will likely face serious harm again. Let's go over the definition of refugee again. Number one, you are outside of your country. Number two, you're genuinely afraid to go back to your country. Number three, you have a good, believable reason to be afraid. Number four, what you are afraid of is something really serious. Number five, you're being singled out for this type of treatment because of your race, nationality, religion, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Number six, the government has harmed you or the government cannot and will not protect you. Number seven, it is unreasonable to ask you to move to a different part of your home country to be safe. Number eight, if you go back to your home country, you will face a future risk of serious harm. Remember, you have to meet all eight parts in order to be recognized as a refugee. Let's take a look at some examples. Mrs. Lego is from Legoland. She is from a minority race Legonasian. One day, when she was walking home from the market, a man hit her and stole her purse. She suffered a cut on her head. Mrs. Lego went to the police. The police immediately investigated the incident and arrested the man who attacked her. Mrs. Lego's attacker was imprisoned for his crime for a short time. Mrs. Lego does not believe that an attack will happen again. However, Mrs. Lego decided she did not want to stay in Legoland, so she left for Wonderland four months later. Let's go through the elements of the refugee definition to see if Mrs. Lego could be recognized as a refugee. First, you are outside of your country. Here, Mrs. Lego is outside of her country because she left Legoland and has moved to Wonderland. Mrs. Lego meets this element. Second, you are genuinely afraid to return to your home country. Here, it is hard to tell if Mrs. Lego is genuinely afraid to go back to Legoland. Mrs. Lego says that she does not believe that the attack will happen again. So Mrs. Lego is probably not genuinely afraid to go back to Legoland. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Third, you have a good believable reason to be afraid. Here, it does not look like Mrs. Lego has a good and believable reason to be afraid. Mrs. Lego's attacker was arrested and imprisoned. Although he may be out of prison now, there's no reason to suggest he would attack her again. Further, Mrs. Lego does not think she will be attacked again. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Fourth, what you are afraid of is something really serious. 
Here, we could say that Mrs. Lego is afraid that she might be attacked even though this is not likely because she does not think that she will be attacked again. But let's pretend she's afraid of the attack. We have to look at whether what she's afraid of is something that is really serious. Being a victim of theft is terrible, but it does not amount to loss of life, torture, rape, loss of freedom, or a pattern of treatment that makes life intolerable. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Fifth, you're singled out for this type of treatment because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or your membership in a particular social group. Here, we know that Mrs. Lego is a member of a minority race, Legonasian. However, it is not clear whether Mrs. Lego was singled out or targeted by the attacker because of her race. Mrs. Lego was probably not singled out for the attack because of her minority race, because it seems like a random robbery. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Six, the government has harmed you or the government cannot or will not protect you. Here, the government of Legoland has not harmed Mrs. Lego. So we have to determine whether the government cannot or will not protect her. Here, Mrs. Lego went to the police after the attack. The police immediately investigated and arrested the attacker, which ultimately led to the attacker being imprisoned. Here, the government is protecting Mrs. Lego. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Seventh, you must show that it is not reasonable to ask you to move to and be safe in another part of your country. Here, we have no reason to believe that Mrs. Lego cannot live anywhere else in Legoland. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Eighth, you have to show that if you return to your home country, you will face a future risk of serious harm. In this case, Mrs. Lego is now in Wonderland. However, there's nothing that suggests that she will face future risks of serious harm if she goes back to Legoland. It looks like it will be safe for Mrs. Lego to go back to Legoland. Mrs. Lego does not meet this element. Let's take a look at another example. Mr. Lego is from Legoland. He is a member of the minority religion, Church of Lego Saints. He is a preacher at his local church. One day, men from a well-known extremist organization visited the church and told him that he will be killed if he keeps preaching his faith. They also threatened to kidnap and harm his daughter. He tried to report this to the police, but they did not help him. Instead, they threatened to arrest him because the police are of the opinion that the Church of Lego Saints is not a real religion. Mr. Lego knows that the men who came to his church are very well connected because he had seen them speak in his hometown to large groups of people in public. He was so scared for himself and his family that they went into hiding before fleeing Legoland to go to Wonderland. Let's go through the elements of the refugee definition to see if Mr. Lego could be recognized as a refugee. First, you are outside of your country. Here, Mr. Lego is outside of his country because he left Legoland and has moved to Wonderland. Mr. Lego meets this element. Second, you are genuinely afraid to return to your home country. Here, Mr. Lego's evidence is important. He says he is afraid to go back to Legoland. 
since he was threatened by members of an extremist organization because he was preaching his faith, and then when he went to the police, the police threatened to arrest him. It looks like there's a good argument that Mr. Lego's statement of being afraid is genuine. Mr. Lego meets the second element. Third, you have a good, believable reason to be afraid. Here, Mr. Lego may have a good and believable reason to be afraid. Mr. Lego was threatened by members of an extremist organization because he was preaching his faith. They also threatened to kidnap and harm his daughter. When he went to the police, the police threatened to arrest him. We could say that Mr. Lego is afraid that the members of the extremist organization would act on their threats, and if they do, Mr. Lego may not be able to seek the protection of the police. These are all good facts, but Mr. Lego will need to provide more detailed information about the threats and about reporting to the police in order to show that he has a good and believable reason to be afraid. For this element, we're going to put maybe. Fourth, what you are afraid of is something that is really serious. Here, we could say that Mr. Lego is afraid that he might be killed by members of an extremist organization. He's also afraid that his daughter might be kidnapped and harmed. Being killed and having your daughter kidnapped are both really serious harms. Further, if the police act under threat to arrest Mr. Lego, then this could result in him being unjustly imprisoned. Being arbitrarily imprisoned is something that is very serious because it results in the loss of many human rights. Based on this, it looks like Mr. Lego probably meets this element. Fifth, you are singled out for this type of treatment because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or your membership in a particular social group. Here, we know that Mr. Lego is a member of a minority religion, Church of Lego Saints. It looks like Mr. Lego was singled out or targeted by the members of the extremist organization because of his religion. Men from the well-known extremist organization came to his church then threatened to kill him if he keeps preaching his faith. They also threatened to kidnap and harm his daughter. Here, the extremists told Mr. Lego why they were threatening him, because of his religion. The threats are directly related to Mr. Lego's religion, because if Mr. Lego had not been preaching his faith, then the members of the extremist organization would not have threatened him. Further, when Mr. Lego went to the police, the police threatened to arrest Mr. Lego because they were of the belief that Mr. Lego's religion, the Church of Lego Saints, is not a real and valid religion. Here, the threat of the police is directly related to Mr. Lego's religion because if Mr. Lego had not been a member of the Church of Lego Saints, then the police would not have threatened to arrest him. It looks like Mr. Lego probably meets the fifth element. Six, the government has harmed you or the government cannot or will not protect you. Here, the government of Legoland has not harmed Mr. Lego. So we have to determine whether the government cannot or will not protect him. Here, Mr. Lego went to the police to report the threats made against him but the police threatened to arrest Mr. Lego because of his religion instead of helping Mr. Lego by investigating the threats that he received. The police did not help Mr. Lego and by threatening to arrest him, they showed him that they will not protect him because of his religion. Mr. Lego most likely meets this element, but it would be helpful if he had some evidence of the policeman's actions. Seventh, you must show that it is not reasonable to ask you to move to and be safe in another part of your country. 
Here, Mr. Lego was threatened by a well-known extremist organization, and he knows that the men are very well-connected. We can argue that because the men are well-connected, it is possible that they will be able to find Mr. Lego anywhere in Legoland. If the police and Legoland commonly threaten to arrest or arrest members of the Church of Lego Saints, then this could help Mr. Lego show that there is not a safe place for him to live in Legoland. Here, Mr. Lego will have to give more information to show why he thinks the men from the extremist organization could find him. He will need to give more information about why he believes that the men are well connected. Additionally, current news or information showing that the police regularly threatened to arrest members of his church could help show that Mr. Lego is not safe anywhere in Legoland. For this element, we will say maybe. Eight, you have to show that if you return to your home country, you will face a future risk of serious harm. Right now, Mr. Lego is in Wonderland. If he goes back to Legoland, he could say that he will face the same risk as before. However, he will need to provide additional information to show why he thinks that the risk from the threats made by the members of the extremist organization are still a real possibility. Perhaps the members of the extremist organization are still looking for him. If so, he needs to give this information to UNHCR. He also needs to show that the threats of arrest to people from his religion from the police are still ongoing. Perhaps the current situation in Legoland has not changed, or maybe it has gotten better or worse. If there are news articles or reports showing this, then this could help Mr. Lego show that if he returned to his home country, he will face a risk of serious harm in the future. Based on the facts given to us, it is not clear whether Mr. Lego will meet this element. We will talk about how you can provide more information to show you in HCR that you meet all of the elements of the refugee definition in the next module. Now that you know the elements of the refugee definition, don't forget to take the quiz after this section. See you in the next module. In this module, we are going to talk about credibility, which is an important topic in relation to your interview. Your RSD interview is likely to last several hours. Now, why would UNHCR want to interview you for that long? UNHCR is assessing your credibility during the interview. This means that UNHCR will assess whether or not the story you tell them is believable. UNHCR will evaluate how you tell your story. The officer will evaluate the level of details that you are able to provide during the interview when you answer the questions. The officer will also look at whether or not your story is consistent. The officer will compare your written statement that you have submitted, any evidence that you have submitted, what is generally known about your country from the news or human rights report, with what you are telling them during the interview. He or she will also assess the information that has been given by your family members during their interview. There is no right story that will ensure that you will be granted refugee status. You will need to tell UNHCR what happened to you clearly and honestly. That is what is important. One way to give a credible and clear statement is to create a chronological narrative. A chronological narrative simply means that you are telling the story in the order that it happened. Telling your story in this way can help the UNHCR officer understand what has happened to you and also why you should be granted refugee status. Here is an example of a chronological narrative. I will tell you about the meals I ate yesterday in the order that it happened. Yesterday, I ate breakfast at 7.30 in the morning. 
Around 9.30 in the morning, I had a snack. Around 12.30 in the afternoon, I ate lunch. Between 3 and 4 in the afternoon, I had tea. At 6.30 in the evening, I ate dinner. I have just told you about the meals I had in a chronological order. That is, in the order that it happened. So here you can see that I started out my day In order to tell your story in a clear way, you should try to tell your story in the order that it happened. One way to help prepare you for this is to create your own personal timeline. Even if the UNHCR officer is not asking you questions in a chronological order, this exercise can be very useful. Start your timeline with the beginning of your story until the time that you came to Thailand. Include all the events in your life that is important and relevant to your story and include why you left your country and why it's not safe for you to return. In the last module, we talked about the case of Mr. Lego and how more information probably would help him get refugee status. In assessing your credibility, UNHCR will assess the level of details that you will be able to provide during the interview. One way to determine whether you are providing sufficient detail is to look at whether what you are saying answers the following questions. Two, did you talk about when it happened? Three, are you including who was involved in the incident? Four, did you say where the incident occurred? Five, why do you think this happened? Let's look at an example. Mr. Lego was threatened by men from a well-known extremist organization who visited his church and told him that he will be killed if he keeps preaching his faith. Let's see if we can answer the questions. 1. Did the statement describe what happened? Here, we can see that Mr. Lego was threatened, and he was told that he would be killed. This is a very simplistic way to describe what happened. In order to be believable, Mr. Lego will need to provide more description of what happened. 2. Did you talk about when it happened? Here, we have no idea when the incident happened. This detail will need to be included. Three. Are you including who was involved in the incident? Here we can see that Mr. Lego was threatened by men from a well-known extremist organization. But we do not know anything more about the men or the extremist organization. Mr. Lego will need to provide more information about who was involved in the incident. 4. Did you say where the incident occurred? Here we can see that the incident occurred at Mr. Lego's church but we don't know the city or the street where the church is located. Mr. Lego will need to provide more information about his church. 5. Why do you think this happened? Here we could infer that Mr. Lego was threatened because he was preaching his faith, but we will need more information to show this. Let's look at another example where sufficient details were given. Mr. Lego was threatened by three men from Legolese Nation, a well-known extremist organization. The men were wearing green shirts and green pointed hats that are commonly worn by members of Legolese Nation. They were of medium build and one man had a long pointed beard. Mr. Lego had seen these men before, speaking at a large public rally against members of the Church of Lego Saints. On 4th of July 2012, Around 3 in the afternoon, the men came to the Church of Lego Saints, located on School Street in Lego City. They came right after members of the church left a religious service. The men kicked the door open and broke a piece of the door. They entered the church, screaming, This is not a true church. Mr. Lego was cleaning up when the men saw him. Two of the men held his arms, while the man with the pointed beard punched him and yelled, 
We will kill you unless you stop preaching this false religion. We know your daughter, and it would be very easy for us to take her away. You do not want to know what we would do to her. Let's see if we can answer the questions again. One, are you describing what happened? Here we have more details about what happened to Mr. Lego. We could see that he was threatened by three men. We could also see that the men kicked the door open, breaking a piece of the door. They also entered screaming, this is not a true church. We can also see that two men held Mr. Lego's arm while the man with the pointed beard punched him. Then we find out more detail about the threats. In this scenario, we get a clearer picture of what happened and can imagine how scary the situation is because we have more details. Let's take a look at the next question. Two, did you talk about when it happened? Here we can see that it happened on July 4th, 2012, around three in the afternoon. It happened after members of the church left a religious service. Three, are you including who was involved in the incident? In this example, we find out more information about who was involved in the incident. We find out that there were three men and we found out the name of the extremist organization. We also get more information about how the men looked. With the name of the extremist organization, it would be easier to find out whether this organization has a wide network in Legoland. Four, did you say where the incident occurred? Here we find out where the incident occurred. It would be easier to identify which church since we now have a more specific location. We can see that it happened at the Church of Lego Saints on School Street in Lego City. Five, why do you think this happened? In this example, it is easier for Mr. Lego to show you in HCR why he thinks the incident happened. The men entered the church screaming, this is not a true church. And the man with the pointed beard told him, we will kill you unless you stop preaching this false religion. It is reasonable for Mr. Lego to think that the reason he was attacked and threatened was because of his religion. You can see the difference between the first statement and the second statement. The first statement was very general, while the second statement was more detailed. Therefore, it provided a clearer picture of what happened to Mr. Lego. That is the end of this module. Please don't forget to do the quiz, and I will see you in the next module. During your RSD interview with UNHCR, you're going to be interviewed alone, even if you came with family. You're going to be in a room with the officer and an interpreter. It's important to understand the role of the interpreter. The interpreter is there to interpret your story to the officer without any change. It's important to adjust the way you communicate when using an interpreter. This means speaking slowly, clearly, in short phrases, and avoiding to interrupt the interpreter. As a good rule, you should speak for no longer than five to 10 seconds or the length of your breath. If you're speaking for too long, the interpreter may use a hand signal to stop you. They're not trying to be offensive, they're simply trying to do their job of accurately interpreting what you say to the officer. The interpreter will not explain any aspect of your story to the officer. The interpreter will also not explain any part of your culture to the officer. It is safe to assume that everything you say during the interview, including any side conversations that you may have with the interpreter, will be interpreted exactly to the UNHCR officer. Remember, it's your responsibility to communicate in a way that the officer can understand. It's also important to understand that the officer is the one who will be making the decision in your case, not the interpreter. Therefore, you should try to build a connection with the officer during the interview not the interpreter. This means using eye contact and body language. Don't worry, the interpreters are trained not to be offended if you don't look at them during the interview. You should listen carefully to the interpreter and wait until they finish interpreting before answering the question. Before responding, take a deep breath, organize your thoughts, and answer the question as clearly and directly as possible. If there are any problems with the interpretation, you can politely suggest solutions.
you have the right to request a different officer or a different interpreter during your interview. If the interpreter does not speak your native language or a language that you're fluent in, you should politely let the officer know and ask for one that speaks the same language as you. If you think that the interpreter is not providing correct interpretation, you can politely notify the officer and ask for a new interpreter. If the officer interviewing you is acting inappropriately or behaving in a way that makes you feel like you cannot discuss intimate details about your case, you have the right to request a new officer to interview you. Note that your interview might be rescheduled if you request a new officer or new interpreter. However, it's more important that you feel comfortable to talk about your case, even if it does mean your interview is delayed. You have the right to take breaks during the interview. This is especially important when the interview takes a long time or when you're talking about emotional or traumatic incidents. You also have the right to ask for water and tissues. Here are some practical things to consider for your interview. Plan to arrive early, as if you're late, your interview may be rescheduled. You may be there all day, so make sure you bring plenty of food, water, any medication, or other necessities that your family may need for the day. Please remember to bring extra water and an umbrella as you may be waiting outside before your interview. Bring all of your personal documents and supporting information to your interview, including anything that you have previously submitted. Your interview will be recorded, however you will not receive a copy of this recording. The officer will take notes during your interview and will write a narrative description of your testimony. Make sure that you answer the officer's questions as directly as possible and provide as much key detail as possible. At the end of the interview, you'll be given the opportunity to add information that was not discussed during the interview. At this time, you can provide additional key details of your story, and you can also address any elements of the refugee definition that were not discussed. That's the end of the training. If you have any questions, you can speak with a case officer at AAT. Don't forget to complete the quiz after this module. On behalf of AAT, we hope that your RSD interview is successful. Ha, ha, ha. Ha.